Greetings, everyone, and um, thanks for joining us here on our um, monthly discovery dialogue. Uh, first, let me just check, make sure everyone, is this, uh, my voice working well? Good. So um, this is, this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be an interesting conversation, uh, to say the least. Um, but before we get into it, let me just first welcome um, uh, my two uh, co-dialogue co friends here, Jessica Groupman and Jeremy Lent. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Preparing for this um, conversation is, um, to be honest, has been very stressful and troubling. Um, some of you undoubtedly are following this AI conversation closer than I had been. Um, but boy, when you dig into this, um, it's, it's startling and very uncomfortable. Um, and honestly, it, it reminds me of uh, when I, when the, when the kind of the, 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 the pieces in the lock that fell in place for me around climate change and my understanding of capitalism, um, I, I had this feeling that we were on this slow motion train wreck uh, that no one seemed to be grasping. And, and now, interestingly, just in the last, I guess it was a, two weeks ago or a week ago, in Europe, there was a conference um, hosted by the European Parliament on degrowth. And degrowth is not a new idea, but suddenly degrowth is, is on the agenda and, and the recognition that exponential growth on a finite planet can't work. But unfortunately, the degrowth conversation um, is lacking a, a constructive pathway out of the predicament because um, if we actually stop growing the machine, um, the, the system will collapse on itself. And so my passion around regenerative economics and a living systems frame is that it provides that pathway out of the predicament we're in. It provides a, uh, a pathway to um, uh, realize unseen potential. And, and that's the real distinction between uh, regenerative economics and, um, for example, ecological economics. Now, what does this all have to do with AI? Well, my experience over the last week preparing for this conversation is that AI is like climate change on steroids. And, and the exponential function underlying this is something that we humans aren't good at grasping, but the difference between GPT-4 and GPT-3 is, is indescribable in, in English. And that's just in the last, I don't know, month or so. Um, so uh, this is a very important conversation. Uh, none of the three of us claim to be experts in AI. Uh, fortunately, Jessica is a expert technologist, and um, and I consider Jeremy one of the true wise thinkers of our era. Uh, all three of us share the um, idea that a living systems framework, an ecological framework, to think about all of our challenges, uh, is the not only right way to go, but the only rational. Uh, way to go and, and holds great promise. So what's unique about this conversation is not our expertise in AI, but a, a, a dialogue around these challenges, looking at them through an ecological or living system lens. Mm -hmm. And um, before, I, um, before I ask my first question of you, Jessica, let me just, for everybody, frame this with some facts in case you're... Um, you know, not up to speed as I wasn't before this. And, th and the first one is hot off the press. Um, this morning, NVIDIA, which is the chip company that is most closely associated with AI, um, announced a, a forecast, not sales, but a forecast of sales in the second quarter that is 50% higher than what Wall Street estimates had been. And the stock is up 25%. And 25% on NVIDIA is $200 billion. And to put that in perspective, that's two times Intel. Oh. So NVIDIA's market capitalization, the value of the company, just grew by 
twice the size of Intel on that one announcement. And that's directly linked to the feeding frenzy that AI is, is creating. Now, the things that people are probably more familiar with is that you know, there's this open letter calling for a six month pause that many of the AI experts have, have signed. The godfather of AI, uh, George Hinton resigned from Google um, because he wanted to be able to speak freely about his concerns about artificial intelligence. Um, uh, he describes it as an existential threat the, the, the super intelligence that will follow um, uh, general artificial intelligence um, uh, is what people are most, you know, are talking about. Um, OpenAI Sam Alton testified, Altman, sorry, testified in front of Congress uh, very recently, a week or so ago, um, and quote unquote said the worst case scenario is lights out for all of us. Um, and, but he hasn't signed the freeze because the the freeze kind of requires everyone to sign it or you're putting yourself in a competitive disadvantage. Um, uh, Max Tegmark uh, uh, M from MIT, Tristan Harris from the Center of Human Humane Technology and, and uh, the historian Yuval Harara um, uh, have all made a splash for themselves in warning about um, uh, AI and its uncontrolled uh, deployment. Um, Tegmark calls it our don't look up moment, referring to the climate change film on Netflix. Um, and I, I just this morning watched an interview with a guy named Elzer um, Yudkowsky, who's the head of research at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. And um, I'm, I'm actually, I said to Jeremy and Jessica just before, I, I actually don't even wanna share with you what he said, um, but I will share with you that he was vis visibly trembling talking about this on a, on a podcast and is, um, you know, has a very gloomy outlook for humanity. So um, I don't share that view and I actually do have a, a hopeful, um, perspective on this that I'll share later um, if we manage to approach it differently. But before we, we get to that, maybe I would turn it to you, Jessica, and just help us understand what this technology is. Um, why is it suddenly in the news? Um, you know, artificial intelligence, that term has been around for decades. And, um, and, and share with us your perspective. I'm, I'm sure you've been thinking about this and reading more about it than, than I have for sure. So, um, so let me stop talking and ask you to help educate us. Sure, um, and thanks. It's it's really uh, a joy to be with you all today in this shared journey of sense making around AI. Um, indeed, AI has been around for decades, and it is in many ways a moving goalpost. We used to call calculators AI and airplanes AI, and there's sort of a quip in the space that once it works, we don't call it AI anymore. <laughs> um, now, about, mm, about a decade ago, there was a real breakthrough around parallel processing um, by NVIDIA, that same company that you just mentioned, John. Um, this plus way bigger data um, and better algorithms has been a kind of convergence point. These three factors have really driven the growth of AI in the last decade um, because much bigger data feeds algorithms, which can be processed more quickly. And so as you can process those algorithms more quickly, they get better. And so that sort of trio is what has driven the development in the last decade. Now, when I was studying AI in 2015 or so, some folks and I got together to try to come up with a better definition of AI than a branch of computer science dealing with simulation of intelligence, because there's a lot of words to quip over on, quibble over on that definition. And we wanted it to pass something more like the grandmother test where anyone can, can understand it. And so I would define, I, I propose as a definition of AI uh, that this is an umbrella term for a variety of tools and methods, which are changing constantly and evolving constantly to mimic, that's the key word, to mimic cognitive functions across multiple areas. Now, five, six years ago, we had defined three core areas 
all AI, all machine learning, all deep learning, all applications from robotics to translation to speech recognition to, you know, satellite image recognition fell into one of three categories, speech or language, teaching machines how to process and understand naturally spoken language, perception or vision. So think computer vision, think self-driving cars, think sensing of heat or temperature or pressure. And then the third category was analysis, pattern recognition, dare we use a word like learning, but all of that pattern recognition, clustering, categorizing, uh, predicting based on that. Now, those three areas were often found in conjunction with one another. A self-driving car, for example, um, is using both computer vision and pattern recognition. So that has been the definition underpinned by techniques like deep learning, like natural language processing, computer vision, machine reasoning, lots of different sub-techniques which have been evolving in the last decade or so. In 2018, I believe it was, um, a, a, a new kind of architecture, a new technique effectively emerged, um, general adversarial networks. Um, another new technique has recently emerged called, which we know now as GPT, generative pre-trained transformers. And these transformer models are really what underlie this, this new generation of generative AI. So what's so special? Why do we care about generative AI? Well, obviously on the user experience side, suddenly everyone has this in their pocket. This has literally been released to iOS. Um, this is the fastest growing technology in history by time frame. It went from zero, effectively very few people to 150 million users in six weeks with GPT-3. So suddenly it's in our face, but the core kind of differentiation and we could just offer on that, it. Just on that, Jessica, just can I ask, so does that mean that it's, what what is too late and what is not too late since that's already out? <laughs> if we're gonna do something. Good question. 150 million people, that number is surely much higher now. And it's, that was also before it went open source. So the genie is out of the bottle, the toothpaste is out of the tube. But if, if humanity wanted to, can we turn that off and, and our screens would go blank? Um, I think maybe something like the Carrington event or <laughs> destroying of connectivity might be able to, to quell it more than humanity itself. But it sits now on servers everywhere. It, it's out, it's out. Um, there might be exceptions to that, but mm. outside of cutting, pulling the cord on vast ICT systems, um, it would be very, 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 very difficult. But um, that's just GPT-3. Um, all these large language models are proliferating at this point, and many have been released in, in, in open source as well. Um, so beyond, far beyond GPT-3. So if I were to update that definition of kind of the three core functions, a new function could be said that this technology can now create, not just language, not just sensory, not just pattern recognition, but creation, ideation, concept generation, media generation. And these things are way bigger, way more parameters. Uh, it used to be machine learning came in around 10 to 100, deep learning 100 to 1,000. Those numbers you know, continued to grow. Just for reference, GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters, <laughs> parameters being you know, the, the nodes and the matrix, uh, the size of the models effectively. GPT-4, um, it's not fully verified, but estimates are around 175 trillion parameters. So way bigger than what we were dealing with even a few years ago. <laughs> Um, now, this transformer architecture. And I've heard much smarter. <laughs> like there are little tweaks that you wouldn't even notice unless you realized what they did to it. So it's not just bigger, but it's actually way smarter. I'm looking forward to defining intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Um, final piece I'll say and then give it back. And hopefully, this offers just a, some differentiation of why do we care about GPT? Um, these transformer architectures are able to process much larger amounts of data, much larger amounts of sequential data in parallel and at scale. And they're able to do so in a way that effectively allows basically any data set to be treated as language. 
So it used to be that a machine learning model would be narrow, would be specialized for natural language processing for a call center, very narrow application. Now, information about text can be combined with information about images, about videos, about G DNA, about fMRI data, about sensor data, about Wi-Fi data, you name it. It is a kind of common, essentially the language of our language, Harari has said, you know, our operating system in this way is now fully inputable into these models to the to to a degree that you know this creates this level of sort of combinatorial possibilities that we can hardly fathom, and this is where it gets sort of an explosion of opportunities, of risks, of things that are really really difficult to predict. Um, but that that's a core difference capability from prior versions and generations of machine and deep learning. Um, and it also means that these foundational models are not bent, are not um, researchers across fields are contributing to foundational models in a way that previously was very verticalized. So the research that was happening in, in natural language processing wasn't contributing per se to the research in computer vision. And we now have folks working on these big foundational models in aggregate, which creates a level of scale and a sort of exponential curve of how fast this is moving. Um, so all of these factors, in addition to our kind of marketing, consulting, media, industrial complex, have us thinking a lot and talking about how um, GPT is is a real step function change in AI. But I would I would observe, and this is you know my my optimism hook on this, which I hope I can develop into a belief system, <laughs> but. What you just described is actually a holistic approach to learning in contrast with our reductionist approach that is the, the, the feature of the modern age. And as I think about the challenge of transitioning from our reductionist machine age, Newtonian based economic system where we generate all these externalities while we're generating progress, this is sort of the same problem and yet AI actually has the ability to work across all these at a, at a, at a scale and at a speed that, that human brains will never be able to process. So, so I'll just plant that as a seed for, for later in the conversation, but maybe let me turn it over to you, Jeremy. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna embarrass you here, but you, you know, your two books, The Pattern and the Instinct, which Jessica has just referred to patterns, and then um, your latest one, other than the one you're working on now, The Web of Meaning. Um, I remember where I was sitting reading this um, and I, I got great comfort that the, I didn't need to worry about the singularity and the end of humanity because you very uh, astutely described the difference between uh, machine learning and human consciousness. And I, in preparation for today, I went back and pulled the book off the shelf and sure, sure enough, chapter two is called The Original uh, AI Animate Intelligence. Um, but, but let me just ask you to riff a bit on your uh, perspective on this, but particularly in your understanding from your study of, of neurobiology and, and, and the brain and the mind and consciousness, um, how you think about machine learning, which is obviously yeah. the, the natural, ex the, the ultimate extension of Newtonian reductionist plus zero plus one minus one logic. If that's exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, thanks, John. <laughs> and um, I do think that actually when, when we're looking at this kind of ex exponential explosion and existential risk, quite literally existential risk, for not just humanity, but all of life, uh, we have to, I, I think we, we absolutely have to look at the deep underpinnings of what it is, where, where, where can we find some more life-affirming kind of force that could counteract what is this um, incredibly convincing story like that leads to kind of that doom and gloom of the people you mentioned or, or originally, John. And I think that um, if there is a, uh, a really meaningful response. It comes by looking at 
this question of intelligence and types of intelligence, just as you're talking about. And um, if we, and I know, uh, Jessica, you, you're saying, yeah, the whole concept of intelligence itself is, you know, it, you could write books about it, but in simple terms, and, you know, this is um, how in Wikipedia, for example, they, 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 they'll sort of just give a simple definition of it, like the ability to perceive or infer information and then retain it to apply it towards adaptive behavior for whatever it is that entity is using intelligence for. So if we just think of intelligence in that way, what is important to realize that there is more than one type of intelligence. Um, and for us as humans, uh, as I and I describe in detail in particularly the web of meaning, but also in the patterning instinct, we actually have two types of intelligence. So the first is this intelligence that actually leads to AI, to artificial intelligence. But it's what um, oftentimes neurobiologists uh, will call something like secondary intelligence, or whatever. I call it conceptual intelligence because I think that's the simplest way to understand it. It's the kind of intelligence that is not necessarily unique to humans among other mammals, but that we have to a uniquely um, great extent. And because of our collaborative capabilities uh, with this kind of intelligence, it's really mushroomed itself. It has its own exponential curve over the millennia. Um, and this is the intelligence that allows us to think symbolically, <clears throat> that allows us to see a, um, uh, ourselves as separate in some ways from others around us. Um, it's an intelligence that gives us like theory of mind, the ability to perceive others as separate entities and figure out how they might act. Um, and it, it gives us um, it gives us language, which then allows that intelligence to spread. Uh, and, and it gives us concept. And it's the intelligence that underlay things like the scientific revolution and the use of mathematics as a way to understand the world, which has led to this explosion of AI ultimately. But and this intelligence has been so strong in humans, and especially in our Western, uh, uh, our Western culture, that we've come to think it's the only form of intelligence. So if you do an IQ test, um, you figure, okay, that's my score. That's my intelligence. That's um, like as if you sort of measure how tall you are. That's, that's, the, that's the fact kind of thing. Um, and it comes from that uh, quote from Descartes, the foundation of Western philosophy. People don't even think about it. And it says, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So that's that thinking intelligence, that conceptual intelligence, which is what Descartes was talking about, is viewed as the foundation of existence. It's the only thing there is. But what we now know from scientific ways and what uh, other cultures have understood always is that there's a different kind of intelligence that nature has. That's the animate intelligence. And that's an intelligence that basically every living entity has. And it's one which over billions of years, life evolved to essentially uh, perpetuate more of life. So it's an intelligence that doesn't use that conceptual thinking, but actually developed in um, warm-blooded mammals and that whole evolutionary branch over tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years, developed feelings. So it's, it's an intelligence that connects with sentience. And this is where it's important to recognize that consciousness actually is an, essentially a different kind of concept than sentience, or um, which arises from life, from, an, from that animate intelligence. But as humans, we have both of those. And I think, uh, just to kind of summarize why I think that, that that's important, and then let's kind of move on to it. I think that as humans, we have the capability to develop what I call an integrated intelligence, one that actually doesn't deny that conceptual brilliance, that conceptual consciousness, but one that recognizes that it's part of something bigger. And one that re realizes that as humans, we do have this unique capability to integrate that sense of who we are as living entities that we share with all of life with that intelligence. Now that's where I feel by focusing on that, and if we can develop systems around that, then we have the potential to counter this incredible rise of this purely conceptual form of intelligence of AI. So Jeremy, that's well, it's fascinating. And it, 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 I'm now remembering the, the book in more detail. Um, help us on just again, before we move forward, how does this fit into our left brain, right brain way of describing our, yeah. our ways of knowing? Well, basically, and I, I don't want to get too, um, it, it can get a little bit too essentialized or simplistic, but in rough general terms, 
The left brain is what also developed uniquely in humans. The left part of the prefrontal cortex, in fact, um, is the part that develops that linear um, thinking more aligned with language. The right brain is um, actually more um, intuitive, more holistic. And in fact, um, there's this great book, My Stroke of Insight by Jill Balty taylor a neuroscientist who's totally left brain thinking who had a stroke, which actually um, put her left hemisphere completely out of commission. And she was able to then recover and tell the story. And as soon as her right brain became dominant, she became almost like a mystic and just got this sense of wholeness and the beauty of oneness of life. So that does seem to be absolutely validated. And one thing that's interesting, by the way, is when the left brain splits, and um, they've done sort of split uh, brain patient studies where people who's had their corpus callosum cut, um, which is what connects the two parts of the hemispheres, um, and then they they close one eye of these of these people, and then had them see certain things, and then make sense of that. What they found is the people <clears throat> who whose only their left hemisphere is active will create stories to fill in the gaps because they want to f find a pattern that makes sense. They want a story that makes sense, and that's mm -hmm. called in neuroscience confabulation. And when we see chat GPT, everyone knows now that you ask chat GPT to your question, or at least three, I don't know about four, but, and it'll give you a wrong answer. It'll be absolutely sure about it. Say, yes, that's right. This is what it is. And here's the facts. And, it, and it's totally convincing until you actually go and realize it's actually not true. And <laughs> that's exactly, so they call it hallucinating. It'd be more accurate to call it confabulating because mm -hmm. what it's doing is exactly what humans who are just left brain, like that's what our left brain does. It fills in the patterns to create a story that makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. But is it is it fair to say that artificial intelligence is the logical extension of less left brain analytical type thinking machine? Yes, learning? absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think really you can sort of plot an exponential curve from the millennia when humans first evolved um, that looks at that left brain dominance. Um, or that conceptual consciousness dominance uh, growing, growing, growing. And now we're on, as we as we shift to this dominance of AI, it's almost like it's, it's totally taking off. And that does, has the potential to lead to that singularity notion, which yeah. in this case would be the singularity of the end of life as we know it. So not in a some exciting positive way, but in right. the most devastating way conceivable. But it's fair to say, and 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 Jessica, feel free to to disagree with this. But it's it's fair to say then that artificial intelligence lacks what you're describing as animate wisdom, and what I would describe as intuition, right brain knowing, um, what Jude Curavan described as the um, I'm trying to remember her language, but she. She referred to our intuition as our, you know, superpower, I think is the word she used. And so that there is something distinctly different from how human minds, consciousness inspired minds work, that nothing in artificial intelligence is coming close to trying to replicate. What artificial intelligence is doing is replicating and exponentially, you know, overpowering our our left brain analytical capabilities. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. I think it's in so many ways, this, this natural logical extension of the reductionist binary. I mean, even as far back as Alan Turing, uh, you know, creator of the Turing machine, the the binary ones and zeros, this is sort of the, the blueprint, the foundation, the first foundational model for all of computing. And what's interesting is that even Turing himself, and this always reminds me of, you know, other great thinkers who have had influence, like, uh, you know, who conceptualized GDP, understood its limitations right at the outset. Turing himself understood that, I think, I believe he called it the automation machine, the A machine, that there would probably be limitations. It would run up to its edges at, at a certain point and that we should be conceiving of of an o machine o standing for oracle he didn't he didn't really develop this concept but he said at the very outset that there would be inherent limitations to this this binary processing just by virtue of <laughs> reality 
Um, I also and, think, uh, Jessica, you know, I, 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 I was just going to ask on that topic, isn't there a concept of a different branch of analog computing that tries to go down away from the binary and, and into that sort of fuzzy, more a material aspect. Is that right? There are several branches of computing that are trying to work outside of the binary and of course quantum computing as well and, and self-learning, self-healing, organic computing. There are there are different. I'm no no expert in these areas, but mm -hmm. but yes, action and reaction and so far as uh, the the limitations of binary compute have have certainly um, inspired different areas of 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 work. Um another thing that always strikes me that's that's so ironic um anyone heard of Moravec's paradox this is this is in robotics um a robotics researcher in the 1980s found that it's it's paradoxical and there's a little bit of kind of the human lens creeping in on this but it's paradoxical that it's easy for for machines for robots to learn his words high level cognitive tasks like math or reasoning but it's really difficult to, for them to learn quote his words, low level sensory motor skills and, and intuition. So mm -hmm. even in the 80s, you know, this sort of understanding that there's something that we're not getting, even if we are viewing it as high versus low. That's very interesting. Let me let me um, pull it back for just a second and 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 share a, another little anecdote. And then Jessica, I, I know this will resonate with you um, before we get to kind of the, the hopeful pathway forward uh at least the possibility of of remaining hopeful in this um you know harari's um he's given a, a couple of talks on this and he wrote a piece in the in the economist <laughs> and and someone took the article he wrote in the economist which and his, his at the heart of his thing is that he he says we've uh we've we've hacked language uh, or, or we've hacked the operating system of civilization because we've we've AI has created an ability to um, uh, to produce language, um, and then secondly, AI has developed a fake intimacy so it can manipulate us, and you put those two together, and it's kind of like social media on super steroids, um, um, probably even more extreme than that, and so his fear is that we're going to remain trapped in some fake illusion he uses the analogy of Plato's cave and for so, for those of you who have been through our course on regenerative economics you'll know that I too talk about our current reality as if we're trapped in Plato's cave we don't actually um, see reality as it really exists and and that reality is defined by our latest science as well as aligned with our wisdom tradition um, but anyway, the funny anecdote is that someone took the Economist article, dropped it in GPT-3, and or sorry, GPT-4, and got a response to the article. And the essence of the response is, um, uh, it reminds us that we humans are responsible, uh, it's our responsibility to deploy and regulate wisely. This is what GPT-4 said. Uh, AI has hacked the operating system of humanity is hyperbolic, according to AI. AI is just a tool. Uh, AI can only mimic human creativity, is what the machine said. And finally, and this is where I know, Jessica, you will um, uh, see your, your own thinking, AI is only a mirror of our own society. We are the problem. That's Isn't what the machine right? said. <laughs> There's something deep about the the AI itself mirroring back to us <laughs> that, that we're a mirror. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'm not the only one, but I've long said that in, in for forever, AI has offered a kind of mirror that we can hold up um, and see. And this this goes both ways. You know, on the one hand, we talked about this a little bit, that it is a natural extension of reductionism, mechanistic thinking, building, designing, quantification of everything, big data, conceptual thinking, all of these pieces um, that we focus it, it's most useful in these narrow, at least historically, these narrow use cases, this, you know, kind of dividing things up into small parts that it tends to reflect, you know, a the common case, the dominant case, the mainstream thinking, what the data has, who and what the data is most likely to represent. Uh, 
the, which is to say not the outliers, not the underrepresented groups, stochastic parrots as this is called in the space. Um, not to mention our economic logic and the logic that we're putting behind these systems yeah. of what we're optimizing for and how and the time scales and, and you know, kind of um, how we think about measurement um, as, uh, again, these tools are an extension and acceleration of that. And then on the other side of the mirror, it's also holding up to, you know, what do we want? What the fact that people in the grocery store, you know, my mother... <laughs> Many hundreds of millions of people are now now have this technology in our pockets. The conversation is rising, and the question of sort of what is the narrative in which we are ad adopting this? Where do we want to take it? This is an opportunity, I would say. Um, it's far from the lab at this point. It's far out in in the world. It is provoking these big societal conversations. At least some of them. We were talking about its parallels with climate change. Uh, it's provoking. It's it's our sensing into its own limitations. For those who've taken the course in the work of Nor uh, Nora Bateson, warm data, this concept, for example, of how do we relationships being the way of the world and systems, and yet relationships are very difficult to capture in technology and in these kinds of machines. So it is it is both. It is a mirror of where we're coming from. And also the kind of, um, you know, structures, institutional, societal sense-making structures that maybe we have an opportunity to revisit. Mm, beautiful. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock. Maybe I'd um, ask each of you to paint your hopeful picture um, on how we will um, act responsibly and, and um, and, and regulate the use of this tool to our benefit. And mm -hmm. I'll share my own, and then we'll we'll bring in everybody else into the into the dialogue. Mm. Jeremy, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I'd be <clears throat> I'd be I'd be happy to. So, um, you know, it is true. I think that um, every cloud has a silver lining, if you will, and it's we have to sort of maybe search a little bit for the silver lining to this one. But I, I think it's there. And, and here's how I see it, basically. Um, one of the things uh, that we can understand about what AI is doing right now, and th this is quoting Daniel Schmachtenberger, who, wrote, who was in, in this great three-hour podcast conversation on this topic, we can recognize that AI basically is an accelerant of all the different processes that are part of what pretty much everyone in this conversation recognizes as our meta crisis we're facing right now. But when we look at the meta crisis as it's been so far, things like climate breakdown, ecological devastation, they are what people refer to often as wicked problems. And the notion of wicked problems is that they're complex, they're far out there, <clears throat> they, they don't have a simple solution. And as such, as humans, we're not we're only evolved to look at the problems that are right in front of our face. And so they tend to, we kick the can down the road, no one really deals with them until they get out of control. But, and oftentimes people have sort of somewhat sardonically said, you know, what we need is like an extraterrestrial intelligence, like some alien power to mm -hmm. suddenly be the threat. And suddenly all of humanity will come together and all our little differences about nation states or ideologies will become nothing compared to this recognition that humanity or life itself is under threat. Um, and I do think that there is a high potential that very soon, and um, there will be this recognition, the collective intelligence of humanity as a superorganism will begin to realize, oh my God, this is what's happening. We're under threat right now. And if that's the case, then I believe that the way, the only way that we can counteract that threat is for humanity to enter really a collective conversation that people in our sort of uh, subculture have been having for a while, but that needs to become a global conversation. When people talk about the alignment problem, like AI is misaligned with what human needs are, they oftentimes don't then say, well, what are those human needs? And of course, we and once you start looking at that, we realize that capitalism has the same alignment problem that AI has. It's misaligned with what human needs are. And if we start, if we start to have that conversation about what are those ultimate needs, and we begin to look at the foundations of values and recognize that 
And ultimately, it comes down to some of these issues between conceptual and animate intelligence I was talking about before. If we start from a foundation of value of life-based, something that is regenerative for life, but something that doesn't exclude humans from that, but something that looks at humans with our, uh, our dual intelligence as being a part of life that can make life actually even more enriched than it, it was without the human presence on earth. If we start from that basis, then it may be possible to actually, and maybe even harness the, AI, the AI to a, a positive scenario, but fundamentally to get the whole entire conversation happening around the world to shift from these um, crazed uh, sort of uh, collectively psychotic topics it's on right now to one that actually looks at the very foundations of what's important. And maybe that becomes the foundation for that path to what I and others call like an ecological civilization, a civilization based on setting the conditions for all life to flourish on a regenerated earth. Um, that's, I think, is what's core. And so you, 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 you hold out some hope that we may recognize this finally as the asteroid barreling down at us and it's time to stop, put, put our pencil down and collaborate mm -hmm. in a meaningful way that somehow climate change hasn't enabled us to do. I think I think that's possible. And of course, uh, those of us who've watched that amazing film, Don't Look Up, um, recognize even when the asteroid's about to hit, there's still this potential for complete um, this like human total like um, sleepwalking zombie kind of space. Yeah. I recognize that, and I'm I'm not saying oh it's all going to be okay, but right. I feel that is the potential pathway towards right. using the the power yeah. this this wake up call to yeah. a different dimension. And, and Jessica, how about you? Are, do you have a, a silver lining in your cloud? I mean, I, I I totally agree with Jeremy at the potential, and in some ways, the you know we're kind of feeling a little bit of this reverberation now of just the broadening of awareness around these topics. There are so many ways in which there are echoes of you know these challenges to other global crises, to other strings in the in the meta crises such as the ecological crisis, such as the social and, and wealth gap crisis. These things are not, they're interrelated. And so kind of no, no matter what portal or doorway you step into, um, this AI, you know, I'll call it a crisis just for continuity's sake, but what this is bringing up um, bleeds into many, many, many different areas. And so I have hope in terms of the kind of awareness that that shakes, as Jeremy was getting at, um, a friend of mine, several friends of mine often say the only thing that's going to bring us together is, you know, an alien, like as an extraterrestrial life <laughs> coming to Earth. And maybe this is a little bit of a twist on that story, as, as AI is often called a kind of alien intelligence. But, you know, there is something um, potentially unifying, um, particularly when it, uh, you know, creates many different types of threats and such threats that exist, um, I'll just say in our pockets to the extent that, you know, current mobile penetration is something like 7 billion people. Um, many, 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 uh, a majority of the global population, you know, has some element of these tools potentially. Um, so so that's, that's huge in terms of shifting thinking, shifting narrative. There's obviously a whole other narrative that we could tell here around dissolution of truth <laughs> and disinformation and so on and so forth. Um, but I do find some hope of that. Yeah, if it, we call it AI alignment, but actually it's human alignment and that remembering, reconnecting ourselves uh, to, to, to the biosphere and to one another. Um, and you know, I think there are some very interesting potential applications of the technology. I get very excited about certain realms of generative design to optimize for, you know, buildings that are using, you know, a certain kind of renewable material, just as a really simple example. Um, this is happening in green chemistry. Very interesting work being done there. Um, the ways in which this could, you know, be given the right data or open us up to the right data, ecological, biological um, data around, you know, what are the best regrowth patterns for a certain locality? There are all sorts of 
opportunities, uh, you know, that could be used that bridge that sort of global need and local intelligence, local context. Um, and, you know, I'll call out Bobby Fishkin, uh, a, a member of the community who has been doing a lot of interesting work around what he calls backcasting from a solar punk future. Uh, for those who focus on innovation, we often do for, forecasting, future casting of kind of starting today and thinking future. Well, backcasting is the opposite. It is creating a vision and then asking, what do we need to get there? Bobby has a whole course focused on what are the, asking GPT-4, GPT-3, what are the criteria that would be in place for, and here's a very long description. And this is just, you know, this is part of getting out of doomerism, not, you know, being stuck in the shackles of despair, but really developing new stories, new ways of thinking, new solutions. So there is a lot there <laughs> that we can derive some hope from. Beautiful. I, I, what I want to just add before we, we open it up, I, um, you know, for those of you that, that know me, you, you you'll, won't be surprised that I have tried to think about this through the living systems framework that we've developed, and in particular through the, the eight principles of regenerative vitality. And, and even before I get to that, I just remind people of the, the famous Bill Reed diagram, where degenerative is on the left and regenerative is on the right. Uh, a little bit less focus in that diagram is on the um, uh, the y-axis, where at the bottom it says more energy materials required, and the arrow pointing up has uh, it says high, first of all higher consciousness, higher consciousness. That's my addition, but also less energy materials required. And um, one of the things that is you know yet again the same pattern is that you know imagine everyone having access to quantum computing capability to to do all this stuff continuously 24 seven for no real useful purpose for humanity. Um, it's gonna generate a huge new burden of energy uh, on our already overly taxed energy system and our urgent need to shift off of fossil fuels onto uh, renewables. So that alone creates a, a reason for pause. And then if I, if I think about the other principles that are, again, not my ideas, but a description of how life works, um, living systems balance, efficiency, and resiliency. And the, the race toward AI is all, you know, all the great problems it can solve are efficiency problems that it can handle quicker and better. But with the same underlying operating system of our current economic system, that will just accelerate all of the um, you know, the problems that we have today, both on the inequality side and the uh, climate or, or ecological crisis side. Um, you know, the, the issue of, um, uh, uh, you know, developing language, I mean, just look at what social media has done to our mental health, our kids' mental health, and our ability to ho have legitimate elections. Um, uh, this will just, you know, in the very short term, meaning probably the next election, um, make the make a human election a, a farce. And it, this won't be a human election, it will be a manipulated humans election. And if empowered participation is a core design principle of living systems, uh, the way we empower participation in the governance of human civilization is through elections or, or not. Um, and I think this this is terrifying to me uh, on the impact it will have for, um, for our ability to, to actually govern ourselves based on, on, on facts and reality. Um, there's a whole conversation we could have about our right relationship with each other based on trust um, that is at risk. And there's also a need in living systems that they be self-organizing and self-governing which gets to the need for an institution of governance that doesn't exist. Uh, we talked in the course about Peter Barnes's idea of the commons. I think of this expression of technology as a brilliant example of, of a technological commons that should be uh, governed and put in service of humanity and of life on this planet, as opposed to sitting inside um, Microsoft and, and, um, and Google and a few other companies in the pursuit of 
obviously um, their their shareholder interest. Um, so on the one hand, I'm terrified about this, and um, and I I um, I see it as as an acceleration of the slow burning um, train wreck that I've been living in and trying to talk about for the last 20 years. But on the other hand, um, maybe it will be the catalyst to uh, trigger us to look at this as an opportunity to drive the transformation to a living systems based um, civilization. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if we uh, use this technology as we were discussing earlier uh, to help us solve these, um, uh, um, uh, what do you call them, Jeremy? The the problems, the the wicked. The, oh, the wicked, wicked problems. The, the yeah, wicked right. problems. Um, it's it's incredibly hopeful, but um, somehow we need to um, we need to re reframe the challenge as a challenge to use the tool to help us transition from a left brain driven mechanistic reductionist way of seeing ourselves in this world separate from each other, separate from the planet uh, into this much more holistic, um, uh, integrative, integrative um, uh, and living system space frame. And gosh, if I knew how to cause that to happen, I'd be working on it. I don't, <laughs> um, but I suspect there are people much more savvy in technology and younger than me that, that um, if we, if we inspire them to be to, to focus on the right challenge, uh, we will get there faster than we think. So that's my hopeful uh, uh, silver lining on the cloud. So maybe I would wrap it up and ask um, uh, Jessica if you could just share with us any closing reflections, and then and then I'll ask Jeremy to do the same thing. Um, I would just say thank you. It's wonderful to have this dialogue. Um, and it's important for us to, to, yeah, not purely act around fear with these technologies, to play with them, to use them, to talk to people about them. Again, a parallel with, with ecological crisis, one of the best things we can do is discuss <laughs> and, and act at a local level. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Jessica, and, and as always, thank you for your your wisdom and and knowledge and and um, and and wonderful demeanor. Thanks, your... mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jeremy. How about your yeah closing <clears throat> thoughts for us? Yeah, sure. thanks. Yeah, well, one thing I I would say is I love um, to feel how this whole conversation and the questions and the comments have moved towards that action orientation, getting engaged. And I think if one thing came out from this, it's this recognition that there really is an alternative power source, which is our collaborative life-affirming capability. And so I think um, it's so crucial as we move from this conversation, it's crucial for each of us to, for, to look at these dire existential fears. It doesn't help to look away and just kind of focus on the positive and hope we won't see them. <laughs> but having seen that, I think it's so, we get got to recognize we have a superpower um, as a shared collaborative humanity to do something about this. And where I see this conversation going, I feel those are the kind of um, filaments that can lead towards that sort of network of life affirming activity that could actually potentially um, even become more energized by this, but, but the potential and the risk that we see ahead of us on AI. Well said, Jeremy. I, I also share that, that feeling of excitement and energy. And I would just invite everyone on this call and, and, and your friends and colleagues, um, don't wait for you know, Jessica, Jeremy, and me to organize this. It's for all of us to organize. And, and you know, Kyle, let's figure out how to plug in with what you're already doing. And, and, um, uh, but, but everyone take the initiative. Um, we're, we all have our, our hands full. And, and while I totally resonate with the desire for action, I also, um, I suspect that most of the people having this conversation about AI have not yet been exposed to what an ecological worldview might mean. And so that I believe, and I'm committing my life to it, is the 
the key starting point to then have the action be in a direction that's actually constructive and productive. So um, uh, that's where I'll continue to focus my own energies, but would love to collaborate with any and all of you on making this happen and the action happen. So um, thank you all again for, for joining us. It was a wonderful dialogue. I learned a lot from all of you. Um, and um, maybe I'll pass it back to you, Rachel, for any, any wind up and then we'll be done. Thanks to the, the J team. We had Jeremy, Jessica, and John today. So <laughs> thanks. Guys. And yeah, I look forward to seeing everyone um, on our next, in our course or our next discovery dialogue. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, in, in a month, we're going to talk about the banking crisis. <laughs> Exciting. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day, everyone. Everyone. <laughs>